Council of Americas, the National Association of Groups out in the country like Global Minnesota. And it's our way of connecting and connecting our whole nation to the planet. And today I have the great privilege of being the moderator for this discussion um, with our ambassador to the United States from Sweden, Karin Olofsdotter. And uh, Ambassador, Madam Ambassador, you were just out in Minnesota, so to speak, virtually uh, at a uh, event where it was right after the big historic announcement about Sweden's intention to become part of NATO. So I'm just thrilled to have been asked uh, to take the place today for our wonderful national president and leader CEO, uh, Bill Clifford, who uh, couldn't be here today. Uh, Madam Ambassador, welcome to our program, to Embassy Live, and we're just grateful for you taking time to be part of this national discussion. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I think this is maybe one of the few silver linings with COVID that we realized we could do this. Yes. <laughs> uh, and Zoom, before we used to have this Skype function at our computer, and we were like, what is it for? But now we use it a lot. So, so that's great. And no, thank you so much for having me. Well, and it's let those of us around the planet um, be able to reach far and wide in terms of perspectives and understanding. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, in Minnesota, we have a very large uh, community from the Swedish descent and also from Scandinavia in general. But we're also very global minded people, those Swedes and others who came here. Uh, really knew we had to be connected to the world and the world to us. So we're thrilled to have this opportunity today. It seems like um, one of the things, and there's many topics to talk about, but one of the things, of course, is the evolution of thinking and now uh, the concrete steps of Sweden becoming uh, in the uh, application process for NATO. Can you update um, our viewers from around and give us a sense of how that feels to you and some trajectory. You can't predict the future, we've learned that, but it's important to get our brains thinking about the ways this will impact the world. And of course, Sweden and the US relations. Well, thank you very much for that, for that question. Of course, the reason why we felt a need to join NATO right now is of course a horrible one. It is Russia's unprovoked attack on a sovereign democratic nation in Europe. Uh, and uh, we had, of course, seen uh, the evolution of Russia as a more uh, unpredictable uh, actor in our region. We already back in for 2014 of Crimea, of course, but also 2008 with Georgia and, and uh, other things that had happened in our region. But we hadn't expected an attack of this sort. The brutality we know about now and, and actually wanting to, to, to grab a sovereign country. So we realized that this, this has changed everything for us. So for many, many years, uh, basically since the fall of the Soviet Union uh, in the early 90s, we, you know, we decided to join the European Union. That's when we dropped neutrality. So before that, we were both militarily non-aligned and neutral. Uh, but we dropped neutrality, uh, kept, uh, you know, the notion of not being part of a military alliance, but joined the European Union, which is, of course, uh, in a way like the United States. It's not, it is similar, it's different, of course, but there are many elements that are very similar to it as well. So uh, we have uh, also already since then been a very you know, close partner to NATO. We were uh, in partnership for peace in the mid 90s. We became enhanced partner to NATO and we were joking, you know, NATO has a membership action plan, but for us it was membership action. We had you know, an <laughs> afternoon of talks in Brussels where they ticked off everything from democracy to you know, interoperability of our armed forces and so on. Uh, and now we are waiting for uh, all the 30 member states to ratify our application. And the two outstanding ones right now are Hungary and Turkey. And we, of course, hope uh, that uh, that process will be swift because there is a war in Europe. And as you've seen, uh, there's been explosions in uh, sabotage on the gas pipeline just outside Sweden and Denmark. And of course, that's very serious. We don't know who did it or, or what it is, but we suspect it's a state actor. And we are in a very, very dangerous time right now. So of course, us having made this decision, we also want to join as soon as possible, both to be able to give security to our neighbors, but also to be able to receive security and to be, you know, um, 
even if we have been so close to NATO, as close as you can be without being a member, we're still, of course, not part of the joint planning uh, of the defense planning of NATO. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's where we really want to be right now. We really want to dig into that and, and do our part and contribute to the security of our neighborhood in the way that we have decided to do. Well, it seems like um, there are two elements of that that would be important in terms of thinking of U.S., Sweden relation. One of them is uh, NATO has really become much broader in its perspective of what is a national security issue. And so, for example, global Minnesota out here on the prairie. Oh, we lost your sound. On the part of NATO is a bigger thing. So it seems like Sweden would bring a lot of intellectual and practical experience and that into but the second thing is that there probably are implications for other elements of foreign policy. This is obviously what Turkey's bringing up all the time, this mixture of domestic policy, foreign policy, all of that. Can you see from your experience of being in Washington, and you know, you're in the United States at some unusual times, let's just leave it at that, okay. And so you're able to see maybe this will enhance and maybe this will create some new rough edges in foreign policy relationships with the United States. Any thoughts on that as you view it from your no. role of representing mm, your nation? But, uh, we, I lost you a bit there on the sound for a while, but I think I, I got your, the gist of your question. And I, you know, when it comes to, to, to NATO, we fulfill all the criteria for, for what is asked of a member of NATO. And then one member of NATO came and asked us for, for some different things that, you know, on, on terrorism and so on. And we went uh, into an agreement with Turkey together with Finland that pertains to addressing terrorism. We have a new terrorist legislation. Uh, it also pertained to arms sales, and we said that we will treat all NATO members alike. And actually, last week, we uh, the government agency that deals with the with the um, how do you say uh, giving the green light to to arms military arms, sales, arms yes, deals arms yeah. deals gave yeah. green light to an export uh, deal with Turkey. Uh -huh. uh, and also, uh, we have uh, increased our uh, cooperation between the Swedish security police and its counterpart in Turkey to look into, you know, if there are terrorist elements in our country and uh, if there are persons that, you know, should be extradited and so on. So, so we feel that we have really, you know, we have taken this concern of Turkey very seriously and done everything we can on, on our end to, to meet their demands. So I hope that this will go forward in a, in a good way. Then when it comes to our foreign policy relationship with the United States, I think this will just make our relationship even deeper. Because it, you know, over the years, and I didn't tell you that we had basically been neutral and militarily non-aligned since uh, 1814, <laughs> when Sweden before that had been in basic every war you could imagine. And, you know, we were so poor at the time, we got a new French crown prince, uh, he thought he came to maybe a more important country uh, or with more, uh, you know, gold in its coffers. Uh, You've seen that realized, big ship in the museum. You yeah, know? yeah. When, he was when, impressed. You know? It is, yes, yes, yes. And then when he realized that, uh, you know, I'm simplifying now, of course, uh, but yes. when he realized it wasn't so rich, he decided that he wanted to be a peace negotiator in Europe. And that's when he declared Sweden neutral. Uh -huh. So, you know, and the, all these poverty and, and the things we, you know, the wars and many other factors led to the big emigration to Sweden, from Sweden to the United States. One fourth of our population left. That's a, a different story, but in, in, in a way it's connected. And then in, um, we stayed out of the First World War, we stayed out of the Second World War. So this kind of neutrality, military non-alignedness has been in our DNA for so long. But then that shifted when, when the communist bloc and the Soviet Union fell. And that's when we started to cooperate much closer with the United States. We had actually cooperated with the United States during the Cold War. This was not really known for the general public at the time. Uh, so even if we wanted, we, we, you know, balance between the Warsaw Pact and NATO, of course, as a, you know, democracy, uh, capitalist society, we were much closer to the Western, uh, Western bloc. Uh, but anyway, uh, so uh, since forever, we have had 
military cooperation with the United States. It's been very, very close and it's just deepened and deepened and deepened until we now decide to join. So, uh, you know, I think we will be even more aligned on a lot of issues going forward, given that we will both be members of NATO and we will be able to deepen our defense and security cooperation within that. You know, our bilateral cooperation will be able to be deepened within us being members of NATO. Well, so um, there's a couple questions already in our chat. I just want to do one was asking where you're located. I'm in Washington, D.C., in, Washington, in the DC. library of the embassy. <laughs> Fabulous. And um, the second is a question about any changes in foreign policy anticipated with the change in government. Mm -hmm. And well, uh, we don't have a new government yet. Uh, we had elections on the 11th of September. And uh, after that election, uh, the party leader of the moderate party, the conservative party in Sweden, Ulf Kristersson, has gotten the task of uh, from the prime minister to try to form a government. He will give an interim report tomorrow, I believe it is, and uh, might come with a government solution or suggestion on Friday. Uh, we don't know that for sure yet, but we know that there are ongoing, uh, very detailed conversations between uh, the Liberal Party, the Christian Democratic Party, the Moderate Party and the Sweden Democrats. So we don't know yet what will be part of their, uh, when it comes to their foreign policy. But of course, there's big unity uh, across the board on our defense spending, on us joining NATO, and you know, uh, on, and on Russia's culpability in this. Uh, so, so that we know. Well, so this is um, one of the things that there's like for this is the 50th anniversary of the big Stockholm conference. You know, 1972 was a crucial moment for many things, but one of them was just recognizing humanity's impact on the planet, the deterioration of the planet's environment, impact on people, particularly on poor people. So 1972 Stockholm is sort of a, an iconic, it's sort of a, 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 a touchstone for much of the conversation that's taken place over these last 50 years and with the sustainable development goals looking forward. Does this feel like one of the elements of the foreign policy where, let's say, Sweden's leadership could be something that in conversations with the United States moves certain agendas and vice versa? How do you see that sort of uh, fundamental identification with Stockholm, with Sweden, with environmental mm -hmm. protection as something that's part of this broader global, let's say, realignment in a certain way on foreign policy? Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to, to climate change, of course, we are very happy that the Biden administration uh, takes climate change seriously. Uh, and in the Inflation Reduction Act, this very sexy name of a policy, <laughs> but it's, it's a clear message of what it's about. Yeah. Uh, there are, of course, climate elements in it. We have some problems with some of them, and that's basically mostly pertaining to electrical vehicles. But overall, we are, of course, very happy that the Biden administration takes climate very seriously, seriously and is back on the international stage when it comes to climate. In Sweden, uh, it's a mixture of both government policies, but also industrial policy uh, coming from, from the private sector. Because uh, the consumers, uh, us, we want climate smart solutions. And we have really been at this since the 70s. Uh, the big oil crisis in Sweden, uh, or global oil crisis, 72, 273. I remember my father sold his big American car because it drank too much gasoline. He was so sad. He's, he's back to owning an American car, but, you know, he had a big Pontiac, but he had to sell it in 1973 uh, because of, of, of the gasoline prices. But uh, we have, you know, uh, and that led to uh, new construction, you know, rules on how we build our houses, three glass windows, et cetera, et cetera, that you got subsidies for. So we have been thinking climate smart in, for a long time. And then also our industrial development has led to a lot of companies. We have uh, actually a very interesting um, project or something. It's called Fossil Free Sweden. And it's 22 or 25 individual business sectors that has taken upon themselves to do roadmaps on how to reduce the carbon footprint. So for instance, the steel industry has come up with the first fossil free uh, steel making method in the world. Wow. Uh, and that's a company that's also invested in the United States. So hopefully they will bring that technology here. 
Uh, the cement industry, uh, as I've understood, is not far away from, you know, being able to, to make carbon free uh, cement, which is a huge factor. So there are a lot of, and this is industry driven, uh, okay, with the help of government, but it is really the industry that has taken it on, upon themselves, because this is what the consumers want, of course. And, and I think this is really uh, something that's very interesting. And I know, I know that uh, a lot of American policymakers are also interested in this. And then if I have, if I don't know, most of you are Americans who are listening to this, um, there's something you should copy that we do. And it's that, you know, all our cans, beer cans and Coca-Cola cans, whatever you have, and plastic bottles, we bring them to the store and you put them in a machine and you get money back. So for every jar, you get like 20 cents. So it means that I think over 80% of all the plastic bottles and the cans we use are recycled. Uh, it's a great method, actually. So I hope this is something you could be inspired to do. Yes, and this is the kind of thing where information sharing gives people some other ideas and then somebody has made this machine where you can drop the bottle in. Yeah. Here we would bring them back and they would count them. I mean, there's all kinds of different systems. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that you mentioned was this sort of notion that it, the consumers making demand, the companies respond, the government participates. Then we're facing really a world market. Sweden's small like Minnesota. I mean, if you really want to get down to size and numbers of people, and so the global market is crucial. In that context, then, WTO, the World Trade Organization, has a whole lot of rules about the things that you can and cannot do in terms of what somebody wants to call a subsidy and doesn't. Yeah. You also end up having a lot of discussion like this last week, we had the big uh, WTO plus FIFA making this giant announcement about fair trade of cotton from certain countries in Africa. So there's, you know, sort of high levels of activity and discussion. It seemed like Sweden is a leader in pushing broadly trade that is contributing to the well-being of the planet as opposed to trade that is, you know, mm -hmm. not contributing. Do you see the U.S. and Sweden becoming more of a partner in those kinds of conversations? Well, I certainly hope so. And I think with the Biden's climate agenda, that is a great possibility. <coughs> and also, you know, our companies are so intertwined. Sweden is actually the 13th largest investor in the United States. And when it comes to population in the world, we're like number 90. So we're huge yeah. here. And our companies, they have the same agenda, basically, wherever they go to be, you know, most of them be climate smart and, and, uh, and push that agenda. So that also makes us linked in a sense. And also I would believe that when the European Union and the United States is uniting on something, when it comes future standards or whatever it's climate related mm -hmm. production or whatever it is, that sends a huge message, message to the rest of the world. And together we are of course the largest market. So whatever we demand in for, you know, when it comes to standards of things and how things should be produced, that then easier becomes the world standard. So that's why the cooperation between the European Union and uh, the United States is so important. And that's where we are a bit unhappy with, you know, the, the um, Inflation Reduction Act, because it makes it very difficult for a European or a Japanese and other uh, producers of electrical vehicles, because the subsidies that you get here in the United States, they go to companies that, uh, to cars that are fully produced basically in the United States. I'm simplifying now a bit. Yeah, 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 and of course, we have car production here, but we also bring in parts from, from other parts of the world, from Sweden and other countries where those parts are made. But we, you know, our production will then be disadvantaged. And we think that this will be, you know, we need more, <laughs> more companies who produce electrical vehicles, not fewer. Yeah. Uh, so I can understand the notion of, you know, the job creation here. So, but this is job creation in the United States, but it's also linked to, to, to our economy. So uh, let's not, you know, let's try to be as, Sweden is one of the few, few real, you know, no, not few, but uh, of European countries that are real free traders. 45% of our GDP comes from trade with others. We cannot afford, none of us can afford to close off the market. Um, we are one. Well, this um, brings into some of the other issues because, of course, 
Um, we talk about conflict minerals. We talk about the future of the green economy needing uh, certain kind of precious metals. We talk about um, child labor. We talk about gender equity. We talk about equity and wages in general. So Sweden has a um, history and a tradition and reputation of particularly advancing gender equity, dealing with issues of slavery and, and trafficking, all of these you know, kind of social issues that are now baked into the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Any insights as you come to know the United States about things that we could be um, exploring more that Sweden is doing in these kind of social areas that we might want to consider here in the United States? Oh, that's a difficult question. But, you know, we, uh, internationally, we collaborate quite a lot on these issues, for instance, on sexual reproductive health rights uh, out in, you know, where we have development cooperation and so on. Sweden and the United States work very closely together with this. Uh, so there, I, I mean, I have to admit, I'm a bit worried about the political developments in the United States on abortion, for instance. Uh, but I hope that uh, because uh, women's uh, rights and sexual health rights and it's a whole body, <laughs> it's, uh, is, is of course very important for development and for equal rights around the world. So we were very happy when, when the United States with the Biden administration came back to this work internationally. But uh, of course, we can both countries uh, inspire each other. And I think, uh, you know, what we have in our country is very high labor participation of women. Uh, one of, I think, if it's not the highest in the world, one of the highest in the world. And that, of course, also, if you're a politician or in an administration, you, need, you want more tax, you want a bigger tax base. This is how you get the bigger tax base. So, for instance, already early 70s, we scrapped joint taxation for, for a married couple. We have individual taxation. And that made women go out to the, in the labor market. And then that mm. led to that we had to have very good child care possibilities and, and elderly care and, and so on. So that transformed the Swedish society in many ways. And that's maybe something I think, I mean, every country, you know, values and how you live are different, but uh, I really think you could get more women out in the labor force here. So this is one of the things about um, Global Minnesota and some of the other organizations that are part of the World Affairs Council is there's a lot of emphasis on exchange, exchanging of students at high school and college and exchanging of visitors and all kinds of things. And so one aspect of that is the going back and forth and having those opportunities and also getting our um, kind of information channels connected to speakers like yourself and others. So sometimes these things are done very self-consciously, like you know, particularly on climate, people will share climate smart. Do you see in uh, some of the other states around the country um, ideas or examples of people connecting at the, let's say, grassroots level in the United States with their counterparts or others in Sweden and it being information exchange at a two-way street? Do you come across but, that in your service in this yeah. role? Yeah, a bit of it, but you know, Swedes in general, we love the United States. You know, we uh, are usually the ones that take on a US culture, the first, one of the first countries in Europe. Out of 10 million people pre COVID, about four or 500,000 of us traveled to the United States every year. A lot of us has been exchange students like I have. We have a lot of collaborations between research institutions, universities, and so on. And then we have all the companies that have invested here. So, you know, we have very, very strong people-to-people -people, uh, contacts. I also, you know, uh, many of our, uh, uh, how do you say, last 15 years, 20 years, our crime novels are widely read here. I think the American Definitely. public has got an eye <laughs> on America's, yeah, to Swedish <laughs> literature and the curiosity about our society. And then, of course, we've also been in the media spotlight. Just look at COVID when, when you know, it was perceived that we had such a different COVID policy. That also creates, you know, curiosity into our yeah. society. Yeah. So I feel we have very strong bonds. Of course, I really would like to increase... Uh, the student exchange, I think that's extremely important uh, to create those long-standing bonds, both, uh, I mean, high school students, 
but also university students. And, you know, a lot of university, if you are a university student or a high school student looking at this, most universities in Sweden right now, as well as in Europe, give full, full programs uh, in English to, I would say, maybe one fifth of the cost <laughs> of the United States. And you would get a totally different experience. Or you can do, an, you know, if you go to college, you, should, you can have a semester abroad. Come to Sweden. Uh, I'm sure, you know, we all speak English. You would love it. I am sure you would. Well, you know, Minnesota is uh, kind of, you know, a little Sweden in a certain yeah. kind of way. And our American Swedish Institute is a big castle in the middle of the city. And it's a, a foundational institution for all the Nordic communities, mm -hmm. from the Sami in the north to the Icelanders and all of that. So one of the benefits of being in Minnesota is that we have a population of people who have come here, you know, starting 150 years ago or more. But um, generally speaking, many have kept close ties, either because they still have family and there's cousins or whatnot, or just part of knowing history and knowing sort of genealogical interests. And so this um, pattern of people coming here and uh, being welcomed and farming and all of that. There's a extensive literature and all that, but it creates a kind of notion that the next waves of generations who come, though we've had very large diasporas recently from Asia, from Latin America, from Africa. The expectation is that people will keep those connection points back and forth and, um, is this the case for Swedish diaspora, like in Africa or in Asia, or is this a kind of a North American, US, Canadian phenomena that there are these continued for hundreds of years now, close ties, family by family, people to people? Oh, you mean with Swedes who have emigrated over the years? Yeah, or? yeah. Um, well, maybe, I mean, the biggest bulk of emigration went to the United States. As I said, one okay. fourth or even one third of our population left in the 19th century. Some came back. Uh, some had very tough times, but then, you know, further generations made it better. And um, there's a fantastic book called, called Sweet Hollow. It's yeah. in English. It's an amazing book about, you know. It's, uh, it's for the neighborhood right next to us. Yes, it is. It is. And yeah, it yeah, shows yeah. how yeah. tough it was. And it's hard. Many, it yeah. describes a a hard life. In yeah, and we many times, you know, just have this rosy picture of the emigrant who then became an American billionaire. And I think most Swedes hope there is some kind of forgotten ancestor in America and you would get, it's even yeah. called an America inheritance. Right, well, <laughs> and you know, the, one, but, the uh, other, you know, you never know. But never know. I think you have been particularly good in your country to, you know, that people have really kept the connection with their original kind of culture. And uh, like at the American Swedish Institute, you meet people who are fifth generation yeah. and they have still carry Swedish names. Young people are extremely interested in like folk dancing or folk music and baking cookies, you know, that we used to do and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't find many Swedish youth. I mean, I'm a mother of an 18 year old yeah. and a 20 year old yeah. who would be caught dead folk dancing. <laughs> But here it's it thrives and it's wonderful and you know it our culture lives on and 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 I think there's even I forget their names now but there are two or one or two gentlemen who plays a kind of fiddle and they because they they it has been brought down in their family so they still play the way it sounded in the 19th yeah. century yeah, yeah. which is lost in our culture so yeah. I mean I I am so impressed by how you Americans in many times continue to cherish your old your roots and of course they get mixed because of intermarriage and so on and now over the the spring and summer given that we are you know joining nato i met so many i met around 50 senators of the u.s senate so many when you scratch a little bit says yeah my great grandmother was swedish or you know i'm 10 percent swedish or everyone yeah. irish yeah. so you know can't <laughs> yeah. compete with that but still <laughs> Uh, it's, no, it's, it's I think it's very, it's fantastic how, yeah. how you carry on, uh, the cult of the cultures that you came with or that people came with. Well, before Sweet Hollow became so famous, you know, there was out stealing horses. And before that became so famous, the main book was 
um, Bring Warm Clothes. That was the title. And it was a book of the exchange of correspondence between people who came to Minnesota and the upper Midwest and writing back home to Sweden. But this uh, kind of general notion of capturing and remembering a, a, a very close friend of mine was from a little tiny, tiny, tiny town called Swedesburg, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And they would come in the summer and record the old Swedish so that it was captured from people who weren't living in Sweden or listening to Swedish radio or whatever. And I, I, I kind of believe that there's an element of the global mindedness. You mentioned Sweden as a, the most sort of free trade related company and a local mindedness of the importance of language and history and genealogy that there's some blend of those things, some interconnectivity of the global and the local that then creates, a, um, I would say, a, a progressive forward-looking culture. I mean, we tend to think of our region having been very blessed by those third of the Swedes that left. You know, this, we would put big signs in Ellis Island about the, unlimited topsoil and perfect weather. And perfect is an unusual word. You can use it on almost anything, but if you bring warm clothes, most weather is fine. Yeah. But the point was we wanted people to come. Mm. And in the early days, if somebody arrived from Sweden and said they wanted to become a citizen, they then were eligible to vote in Minnesota. This didn't go on forever. It was changed and stuff. But um, I sort of feel like, I live in a region that was blessed by waves and different kinds of people, but all had some sense of remembering the roots and then putting down good roots here. Mm -hmm. You're the ambassador in a country that was very blessed by people from Sweden. Some went back, like you mentioned. Do you see the patterns of relationships altering or do you see them going in new ways, you're raising probably teenagers, young people probably are defining our future <laughs> as old mm -hmm. people right as we speak. What do you see when you think about these global connections? Well, I, uh, unfortunately, we are in a time where we are seeing more and more authoritarian regimes around the world and uh, just seeing the war in, in Europe, uh, of course, is horrendous, but there are worse other, in other places and a lot of regimes that are, you know, going in that direction. And that's, of course, extremely worrisome. And, and also people fleeing for, you know, both religious persecution, poverty, but also living in authoritarian societies. And there, Europe has been a big, you know, uh, pull has a, had a big pull factor of a lot of people fleeing from extreme hardships and wars, look at Syria, Afghanistan, many parts in Africa and so on. And, and I think in a country like mine that has been extremely generous when it comes to, you know, uh, taking in refugees and so on, we feel that maybe we have reached a limit where we can't, it's been tougher for us to integrate people Maybe our resources are not enough to, you know, take them in in a good way, et cetera. So the elections that we've had the last few times has really been about how do we how do we integrate people? How do we make sure that the ones who come to our societies can thrive and can contribute and, you know, can learn the language and be part of the society? So I think this this is all connected in a way. And the reasons why many Swedes left in the in 19th century are the same as people are leaving today. Uh, we, okay, we didn't have a war in the, in the mid 19th century, but poverty was uh, it was awful. I mean, many you know look at Ireland and all the Irish people left. We also had uh, religious freedom was limited. Um, it was a very hierarchical society. So there were many reasons why people left then that are the same why people leave now. And of course, you were in a time of a U.S. history where you were building a nation and you needed and wanted a lot of people. Uh, and, and even though, as we said, it was very hard, hard for them, uh, you know, over the, over the generations, it's gone well for a lot of them. But of course, it was very, very tough in the beginning. And that's also similar to, to maybe analogy is a bit different, but that the people who are coming to our societies today, uh, fleeing, uh, it, it's tough for them as well. And the uh, societies have to, to our societies have to adopt uh, or adapt so that the people that 
that do come and that we do take in, that they can, you know, uh, have the best possibilities to also help build our society. So in a yeah. way, there are similarities, but also different, of course. There's, um, it's always funny here because there are so many people from Somalia who speak Swedish or they speak Norwegian and, you know, and so it's, uh, you can, you can go to Meinekirchen in the church, the Norwegian language church, and you'll, it's, you know, kind of mind boggling, but here we are, we're in a global society and we're having to talk about, you know, something as old and as awful as just war's progression. And there's some other questions in the chat that I uh, want to bring to your attention. One of them was just asking the general state, Swedish Army and Air Force, but then specifically mm -hmm. it asked um, the general state of the uh, Swedish aerospace industry, I assume defense related or aerospace. Yeah. Um, uh, this seems like a, a fun one to tackle. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, you know, we're a country of engineers. And as I said, uh, us being militarily non-aligned and neutral uh, and us trying to balance between the Warsaw Pact and NATO during the Cold War also made us realize that we had to support a strong national defense industry. So we have, a, for being such a small country, we have a very strong military uh, industrial complex. So we build our own submarines, we build our own fighter jets, lots of weapons. Uh, we, we also construct and develop ourselves. So, you know, the idea was that during the Cold War that we, we couldn't buy basically from one side or the other. We had to, had to provide, to, to make our neutrality really believable. Uh, or people to trust in it. Um, that, so, so we still have this fantastic industry. We uh, sell our fighter jets. Uh, we many times compete in the bidding process to or to American uh, fighter jets, but the content of our fighter jets is actually 50% US. So if we win a contract and you don't, you shouldn't be sad because it creates a lot of jobs in the United States when we win those deals, when we win those deals. We have just decided, uh, I think it was in a, half a year ago, or longer, to go for 2% defense spending. Uh, and that is because, of course, we are seeing what's going on in our neighborhood. We, during the Cold War, we spend about 3 to 4%. Uh, then, you know, fall of Soviet Union, we thought there was a brave new world out there. We didn't need as much. So we went down to almost 1%. Late 1990s, we realized it was too little. So we started increasing um, and now we've just had this decision for 2%. That means a lot of procurement, of course. We have just uh, procured a Patriot missile defense system from the US. Uh, our head of the army is coming here in a week and uh, we joked last time that he was here a year ago that he's on a shopping spree uh, in the US. And this, of course, builds also very close links between our countries. Uh, you're not going to sell your fighter jets to us because we produce our own. But our fighter jets are totally interoperable with yours and, you know, to NATO mm. standards. So, so that's important. So with us having our strong uh, air defense in Sweden and also increasing the amount of fighter jets we have, Finland just having bought 65 or ordered 65 F-35s, Norway, uh, I think, I'm not sure if they have 50 or 40 fighter of, of the F-35s, but together we have about 200 fighter jets in the north uh, of Europe. So that's, of course, a formidable power uh, that, you know, when Sweden and Finland joins NATO, you, we bring to that cooperation. So just looking at that, you will see how much stronger the north of Europe becomes. And then if you realize if we cooperate with Canada, the U.S., uh, the UK, uh, Iceland, okay, they don't have military force to that same extent, Denmark, us, uh, you know, on the north, the north of the globe. And then, you know, we see how what China is doing in the area and, and Russia. So, of course, when we can plan together also for that region, it makes us very strong. So, so this is really a growth sector in my country. Well, it seems like that description of sort of the Arctic Council or the Arctic Circle, the Arctic region, is something that we actually share in addition to sharing population and people and heritage and all that. But um, I live in Minnesota. Some people think that is in the North Pole. It's not, but we are far but It's north. cold sometimes. <laughs> it, it, it can be cold and embarrassing. So then we have many uh, great stories about that. But of course, in the summer, it's beautiful here just mm -hmm. like it's there but thinking about the arctic 
I know for Norway, it was at the top of their foreign policy list for a long time. I mean, this is a very high priority. I would say for the United States, it's somewhat isolated just because of the way Alaska is so disconnected. Canada, very interested, very focused. Do you see some ways of, you know, whether or not NATO, any of that, but can you see some elements of global cooperation in that Arctic region that can be a stabilizing force or a stabilizing uh, opportunity for this kind of upside down world we're living in right now? Yeah, well, of course, all the countries I talked about before, we cooperate very closely and we are all members of the Arctic Council. Uh, and Russia has the presidency right now. So uh, this the countries that are, you know, the other member states have decided to still meet without Russia and doing projects that we can that, you know, the ones that doesn't involve Russia. But I think uh, the worry about climate change is maybe ma maybe the most important factor to, to collaborate on and, and where it maybe could be possible one day to get back to collaboration. Uh, you know, the permafrost is melting in, in Russia and the methane gas is coming out, et cetera, et cetera. The poles are, are it's, um, melting. I don't see us doing that right now, given the, 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 the situation uh, with the war. But I really hope we will get there. And of course, I hope the war will end soon. And, and, uh, and um, of course, then we will have to see how we deal with Russia after that. So it's very hard to predict. But it's really important that the rest of us, you know, uh, monitor the issues there very closely and that we take climate change issues very seriously because this, of course, affects all of us. It affects even, you know, islands somewhere else where <laughs> when the water raises because the poles are melting. So this is extremely serious. Also, just wildlife and, uh, and natural, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, raw materials, etc. Et so, so I don't think we've seen this. I mean, it has started, but I mean, we don't haven't seen the end of where this will go. Uh, no, but it's know. a very serious region, and and I'm very very you know we have an Arctic strategy. We are an active member of the Arctic Council, uh, so even if we are not, you know, we don't have a border up there, but you know, still, given that you know the Baltic Sea and our west coast, it's all connected, and we also have lands, of course, above the polar circle. Uh, uh, this is something that's very important for my country and where we collaborate with you very closely and the others as well. In 1972, I grew up in the middle of Iowa, in the middle of the continent, but um, out on the Bering Sea in Alaska, the permafrost was melting due to climate change, creating small ponds and children who had never been swimming or had swimming lessons were drowning. And so they declared a public health emergency because of the very, very high number of children that were killed. They hired young people, myself and others from the middle of the country who had certificates to teach swimming. I drove up to Alaska, went out in 1972 and taught swimming out on the Bering Sea so that kids could be able to survive with this changing climate. That's 50 years ago. And so for 50 years, at least the campfire girls have known climate was changing. Mm. Governments have known. In yes. fact, our most famous book on climate is they knew. Mm. What do we do about a 50 year of lying by so many institutions to get citizens to then really take the predictions, the plans, the modeling, the ice shearing seriously? after 50 years of lying or perhaps just not sharing what they knew? Mm. Well, I don't know. Maybe this is my own speculation, but human nature is maybe like that, that we don't want to see it. We didn't want to realize how serious this was. And it's when it's really serious and it's like two minutes to midnight that we, we really realize yeah. it. And, and I, I'm, sometimes I wonder if we even realize it to the extent that we should today even when we have seen a lot of this. But as I said before, it's a combination of a lot of things, awareness, uh, you know, public consumption, everyone's both public consumption, but private consumption that has to, to, to push this uh, for us to change. Uh, so there are many factors and of ed education is super important that we teach children 
uh, about this, uh, about what to do in your own responsibility in this, but also, you know, things that can be done and, and how serious is it, it is. So, so there are so many layers to how we, how we tackle this. But you are right, we probably need to speed up a lot. Well, so this um, way that our world has become more circular, you know, one of our most famous chefs ever, Marcus Samuelson from Ethiopia, from Sweden, from Minnesota, and now from New York and Miami, these interconnection points seem to be the bright spot, the, the connecting the dots that then makes life more exciting and, and, and more thoughtful. Have you found in your special role, and I know you've been in foreign service and had a lot of very particular and very special assignments, but have you found this job being in, back in the United States and in this role gives you enough of those things that lift your heart that then helps you to keep an even keel when you're reading those cables and whatever they make you do now, they go, oh, yeah, no, well, right not now. Again. I mean, I have, I have to admit, I'm at a very, I'm at the low point right now. I, I, I with this war and what we see, the brutality of, of it, it's just, I can't, I, I find it hard to fathom. And I'm very proud that we have all, you know, stepped up to help the Ukrainian people, the way we have, and taking refugees, sending arms, military, you know, equipment, and and other things, but. It's, I, I still have a hard time seeing, I mean, I know this sounds very like Eurocentric, but that's where I come from. And I know that there have been wars and wars are going on in other parts of the world at the same time, but this is close to where I live or where I come from. And my grandmother, who was born in 1900, you know, she um, lived, uh, we were not at war, but still, you know, she lived through the, both the First World War and the Second World War. And she always, when I went to Russia as a student in 1991, she cried. She was so worried because she said, they will chop off your fingers and take your watch and you know, all this stuff. Because through our history, we have been at war with the Russians. Uh, and I came home and of course I had met fantastic people, Russian people are just as lovely as any other people. And we had a you know, great time. I lived with a family there that I got to know and I showed her pictures and she said with surprise, oh, but they look very friendly. I was like, yes, they are very friendly and lovely people. So I just hope that what we hoped for in the nineties, you know, with the Russia, democratic free Russia, um, a very proud and fine country in so many ways with so many possibilities, We'll get back on that track uh, because that is very important. So right now I'm at a little bit of a low moment, uh, but then again, Sweden the other day, uh, European Union has done a you know survey of most innovative countries. Guess who came out as number one? So yeah, it was it. fantastic. Yes, and we're number yeah, yeah, yeah. two in the world: Switzerland, us, and then the U.S. So there are things, of course, to be very proud of, and and you know we see young people, as you said. My son has just, or our son has just started an engineering degree in Stockholm. Our daughter is in Spain studying business and all her friends are from all over the world. And so are his. And it's, of course, fantastic to see what they are doing and how they see yeah. the world. And that gives you hope. And my son went to a school in Norway with 200 children from or young people from, from 70 different countries around the world and really global. And that, that's amazing. So That's I, I guess every generation has hope for the next generation. Well, and it's part of our, you know, angst about particularly climate, which is really about cutting off the possibilities mm -hmm. of the next generation, you know, in many different ways. But we have coming up very quickly now, the pre-comp happening right this moment in Kinshasa, then the regular conference of the party on climate in Egypt. Next year, Abu Dhabi, Esapri, and, and Dubai. Um, Sweden has its own interests, and it's also on the edges, so it gets the most impact. Any insights into what the Swedish government will be pushing, proposing, or nudging in these um uh, you know, global gatherings that are underway right now. No, I don't, because as I said, we are just now in the, uh, the present government is a caretaker I, government. And uh, the new government, whenever it's formed, will have a government declaration. And then I'm sure we will know more about, 
you know, how they will handle these issues, if there are any changes to it or if they want to do the same, you know, every, every government wants to tweak it this way. But I mean, Sweden has always had a strong climate uh, policy. policy. So I'm sure, sure it will be. It could be a little bit different, but it's still high on the agenda. I, it's uh, always amazing to me, having lived for some amount of time in Europe, but the whole notion of the parliamentary system is, is in many ways very different from what we have. But the Danes made that TV series Borgen, mm -hmm. which then brought to life in the lives of regular people in a way, an amazing way to understand, oh, that's what they're up to over there. Oh, that's what. <laughs> so anyhow, there's things that we can keep learning from each other. And one of them is just the different systems. And then what's the purpose of the system? And so protecting ourselves and then protecting the future and it's part of the thing about war and the destructiveness of war, you know, whether, you know, whatever it is. And I am reminded of the way that the, the Swedish series, the restaurant described how societies get torn apart. Yeah. By war. yeah. You know, might be neutral, might be no dropping bombs in New York or Milwaukee or whatever, but people get torn apart. And this is part of the, the thing. Well, one aspect of the World Affairs Council is, of course, it scares the dickens out of people talking about some things. But I try to make sure that we're taking the time to talk about the amazing things that happen when people come together and when people connect. And you're just describing what your children are doing. Yes, you know, so we need to accelerate those things. COVID notwithstanding, is there some way you could give advice to World Affairs Councils about ways that we could be more interactive with more elements of Swedish society, with your embassy, with the consulates or the honorary consuls around? Because I think we're two, we're organizations who are motivated to do things and good advice is something we like to take and do something with it. Yeah, I think, um, I'm not sure if you would have a kind of sister organization in Sweden, uh, but there's one organization called, uh, it's called People and Defense, if we just translate it directly. That's such a grassroots organization that's very interested in like security policy and global affairs. People and defense? Yes, we can send you a contact. Yeah, okay, contact. good, good, yes, yes, yes. And also, you know, uh, just like any country, we have a lot of experts on a lot of things. So if there's some particular, if you would like to learn everything about recycling bottles and cans, we will put you together, you know, with those kind of yeah. groups. Yeah. So, so that's that's an idea. And does your embassy do a little English language news from Sweden once a no, week? We once a no, we don't. Month, no. Because da, da, da. American Swedish Institute, of course, is something that you know anybody can connect to yes. and, and join in that way. Well, so um, today um, we are very near the end of our time, but. Um, what we are is near the end of this long relationship of America and Sweden and a really new period coming uh, when we're in, in addition to other relationships, uh, we're in um, a military alliance that puts national security and climate in a big national security box and says, we got to figure this out together. So I'm hopeful that all of those changes will be ones that then help our societies really connect more. I wanna give you the last few minutes for messages out to, you are talking to people who are global minded, but people who are equally worried, their hearts have been broken, all the good things that people do, then a war just kind of blows it up. Um, but they are very interested in hearing um, what do those who have an overview and a perspective advice and ideas? So I'm turning the microphone over to you to take us out with some specifics that people go, oh, I can do that. <laughs> well, that's a big ask, I must say. Yes, yes, I'm wiser, You're the ambassador. Wiser than any one of you. Uh, <laughs> but I really think... It is very important that the United States and Europe have a very strong bond. And, and that really comes with people-to-people -people contacts. And if I was American right now, and I don't know your economic status or anything, but it has never been cheaper to go to Europe than now. So go, do come, learn, eat our food, travel to various countries. 
Uh, you can go interrailing in Europe. It's fantastic uh, for a couple of weeks, and it's it's very close. Everything you know. I lived in Brussels and it was three hours to Champagne, another hour to Amsterdam, and so on. So really take the opportunity to come and 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 learn. And I would really like more uh, Europeans and Swedes to travel to more places in the United States than Florida, New York, and Los Angeles and San Francisco, because you have one of the most spectacular countries in the world when it comes to a lot of things, um, and parks, national natu national parks, and and hospitality, and and all that. So I, I I really hope so. But even though, as I said, I'm a bit in a, uh, I think it's very tough with the war situation and and how that affects us all. Of course, mostly the Ukrainian people. Uh, but that we really continue to be strong, fighting for democracy, fighting for, you know, freedom. And it sounds very superficial, but it isn't when you see what's going on. This is important. Uh, we should be very proud of, you know, our societies have many faults. Uh, absolutely. But they are also bringing very many fantastic things and that we safeguard those uh, for all of us. So I think that's really important. So it's important Amen. to be engaged. And I think those of you who listen to this, who are engaged in World Affairs Council, that, that's, a, that's really good. Yeah, I, I'm just realizing that um, I hadn't followed as directly, but Asia, Europe, different places, the way the dollar and currencies have moved, this is the moment to break away the mons of COVID change and to get on... Uh, means of transport and go meet other people mm -hmm. thank you for well, that for us reminder. it's a little bit expensive over here but uh, you come and visit uh, us <laughs> it, yes it's a problem but in minnesota it's less expensive and we'll take you to sweet hollow guaranteed yes. Yes. thank you so much yeah, madam read Ambassador. that book read sweet hollow sweet hollow s-w-e-d-e -E, hollow h-o-l-l-o-w -L -L it'll blow your mind thank you again and thank you for joining and us thank today. you so much everyone for listening Goodbye. thank you and for your questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.